You are listening to Unscripted Moments, a podcast about propaganda. On this episode, I am delighted to welcome John Sampson Fellows. John's work is well known as a member of Propaganda, The Weaker Thans, as a solo artist, and now releasing music under the moniker Vivat Virtute. On this episode, we discuss John's work as a teacher, his weaving projects and music with Christine Fellows in Vivat Virtute, the 2023 June 1st EP, his favorite memories of Propaganda, and more. The music you're hearing right now is Rockwood Pickleball Club, track one on Vivat Virtute's Hold Music LP. Please go check out what John is up to at vivatvertute.com and at vivatvertute.bandcamp.com. Please enjoy my conversation with John Sampson Fellows. John Sampson Fellows, welcome to Unscripted Moments, a podcast about propaganda. Thanks for having me, Greg. I'm so delighted that you're here, John. I'm really interested to hear about like what your life is like these days. Um, mm. As somebody who's followed your your work for for so many years of my life, to find out that you are a teacher now is mm. such a just a thrill and just speaks to my heart um, as a person who's been teaching for the last since 2004, 2005. I've been a teacher, oh, wow. so I'm just so excited to hear about your your current full time work and what you're doing just tell the listeners out there or the in the readers like what you're sure. what you're up to these days with regards to your uh, your career sure yeah so i've been teaching um a university level creative writing class at stony mountain institution which is the federal jail just outside of winnipeg here and it's through this really interesting program called walls to bridges where universities kind of sponsor university courses within jails I started during the pandemic, I guess. Yeah. And I'd done, I I kind of fluked into the job because I was doing other stuff at Stony Mountain. I started a book club out there around 2014. I co-founded a chapter of this thing called Book Clubs for Inmates. And so I would go out there with a couple other volunteers every month and we would talk about a book with incarcerated people. And, um, One of the people there knew someone who was looking for a prof or an instructor, and it all kind of came together. And I think the fact that I had my clearance and that I had experience in jails kind of uh, helped me with that. So it was really, it's been really, uh, I've really loved it. It's really, it's been great. I've been, uh, you know, like developing a curriculum and a course outline was super interesting. And um, yeah, I've sort of, based it around zine making as well so sweet yeah the kind of point is like or the final project is a class zine that we make together and so we're basically throughout the term we're kind of generating content for our zine and then um, we make enough for them to give to friends and family and put some at the University of Winnipeg which is where the program lives yeah so it's really it's been it's been fun and and it's uh Yeah, like mostly it's um, people who wouldn't necessarily take a creative writing course. I mean, it's certainly not really their first choice, really, but it's one it's one of the few courses that are offered. So I try and focus on really kind of practical creative writing. Like we start by doing um, by writing toasts and and obituaries and um, cool. Yeah. And and then we move on to poetry and memoir and op-ed pieces and reviews. We have a lot of people who write kind of reviews of the institution that they're living in and Mm. use of the food and stuff. And yeah, it's really, it's been a really fun process. And then the kind of cut and pasting at the end is always really fun. And I've really enjoyed that. This is my third year doing that, I think. And then I recently got another job which uh, through a place called the John Howard Society here in Manitoba, it's a nonprofit that an agency that uh, works with people getting out of jail. <clears throat> so get yeah, or, or who are about to get out of jail. So I work with people on um, getting ready for their GEDs or like, um, and then I go into the remand center here in Winnipeg, which is, which is where people are kept pre-trial. And um, 
and I work with them on literacy stuff with a group of volunteers. And so that's really fun too. And a little bit scary. Like I, uh, I realized right away that I would not pass the GED if I mm. had to take yeah, there's some real there's some real challenging things and just kind of working within that that system is a real kind of challenge. Anyway, yeah, so yeah. that's kind of where my teaching's been at. I sort of fell into it and I and I really like it. Do you have any like specific um texts that you love to teach with with your students that really like that you really have found is kind of like your niche as a teacher. Like for me as a teacher, like I was always super into teaching Gilgamesh and the Bhagavad Gita and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And like, I'm wondering if you have any like texts that you're just like super into teaching. And like when you start that, you're like, yeah, here we go. Yeah, I do actually. Yeah. I have a few. Um, uh, we start with a George Saunders editing piece. George I Saunders, love him. A short story writer. He did this kind of piece in one of his books about, he lays out the short story and then you have to you have to take five minutes and cut 20 words and then you have to do like phases until you till you've got it down to like just a paragraph or whatever. Yeah, that's always really fun uh, for people who have never really edited before. I rely pretty heavily on this book called The Sentences Within Us, which I think was published by Haymarket uh, not too long ago. And it's just full of writing like I like to focus Aside from that George Saunders piece, it's all uh, writing from people who have been incarcerated or who are incarcerated. So I want to really nail home the point that writing is valid and important, and they're the only people who can do that writing. So, and there's a lot of incredible writing from from inside jails. So yeah, uh, I just I've built up a collection of prison writings over the years. Amazing, and you you publish these in volumes like. Um... I love that. Have you just been kind of blown away by some of the stories that your students have been able to kind of tease out of themselves? Because I like me yeah. for me getting to getting 15 year olds and 16 year olds to write a creative short story. Mm. They're they're so determined that they are not going to succeed at the beginning yeah. of the process. And then when they get to the end of it and we do like our readers theater and stuff where we like are reading yeah. passages from our stories aloud in class. They just are bursting with confidence. And like, it's like you, you see people find their voice in real time and it's just such a powerful moment, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. You're right. I'm sure, I'm sure it's the same thing. Yeah. It's, it's beautiful when, when they figure out the, when it's sort of unlocked and you're like, oh, I, I can write about myself, write about my life and make something that I can share with other people. Yeah. It's a huge, it's a really powerful thing for sure. Do you write with them? Like, do you share things yeah. that you're writing as well while they're writing too? And you kind of like bounce stuff off of each other in real time? Yeah. And like, because, because I'm teaching in a jail and they don't have a lot of uh, private time, obviously. We often do a lot of writing in class. Like we do little, little fast little exercises. So I'll write, I'll write with them as well. And that, that is fun. Yeah. I like, I like that part of it. It's, it's enjoyable. And then I share in the circle as well. And I do think that that kind of brings everything into a, a level kind of playing field. And a lot of this kind of writing that I'm teaching is not something that I'm particularly good at. Right. So, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a big prose writer. I don't, I don't write an argument very well. So it's, uh, it's nice for me too. It's, it's helped, it's helped me as a writer. And I do feel like, yeah, it really, it's important to um, be, be in the circle one of the things that I always loved about teaching was whenever we would do a unit that I was particularly bad at, like mm. I'm, I'm a terrible poet. It's yeah. just <laughs> awful. And we would do yeah. these poetry units and these poetry studies. And I would try to write poet poetry with the students. And some of the students mm. were blowing me out of the water, 16 years old, writing sure. things that were just moving to me to my core. And I'm over here just clunking along just, and I'm like, Hey, look, I'm just like doing it anyway, even though I stick yeah. at it. And they always liked it whenever I would like acknowledge my own, shortcomings yeah. it was yeah, kind yeah. of a way to bond you know what i mean um, yeah absolutely and writing is you know that's yeah that's what the power of writing right is the is the yeah anyway. do you have do you have some goals in in teaching that you're like shooting for in the next like i don't know three to five years like where do you see yourself going with the with the work i guess um with my work at john howard is sort of new and um yeah i'd like to get better at stuff that i'm bad at so like math for example i'm terrible at math i'm really, yeah, really me too. Bad. lately i've been 
teaching a bit of math and it's it's been rough though the fact that we're learning together is pretty cool but yeah I definitely want to kind of get my skills a little bit raise my skills in fields that I don't really know that much about so mm -hmm. but luckily when I go into John Howard I have these volunteers who come with me and they're a bunch of them are teachers and so they They've been kind of coaching me on how to how to teach this stuff too. So just showing up for incarcerated people and trying to help them express themselves is the long term goal. And then also just the real practical stuff. Like uh, lately, I've been helping people write resumes and mm -hmm. and, um, and do stuff like that. And I, I, yeah, I want to get like just better at that stuff math and uh but math's a big one yeah well i tell you what let me empathize with you on the math thing for a second because i have a 10 year old yeah. in fifth grade oh, wow. and yeah. she comes home with these math assignments that just <laughs> they're taught in a totally different way than i was ever taught oh yeah and the I've way that they that. chunk math and uh, break down uh like you know numeric yeah. pro like characters and stuff like that into smaller pieces and then put it all back together it's really mm. amazing the way that it's being done now so my 10 year old is doing that for me by helping me rethink the way that math and numbers work together and yeah. they help me break it down and it's so like amazing it's yeah absolutely so cool that my 10 year old yeah. is doing absolutely is doing that for me i'm i'm just delighted by it yeah awesome well john i want to talk about music for a little bit if that's cool sure yeah yeah post weaker thans you have been musical been making music you know i'm thinking about your millennium for all single fantasy baseball at the end of the world and your work mm -hmm. um with with christine fellows and vivat vertute tell me a little bit about what you've been up to musically kind of since you've been in this this next stage of your your musical journey so yeah i'm not really sure what this stage is but i've been um i haven't been writing a lot of music but when I do, it's been really kind of focused on things that I'm doing, organizing work and um, activist work, I guess. So, yeah, Millennium for All was this song that I that really kind of grew out of this um, activist group I was a part of called Millennium for All. We uh, started working together when the kind of over securitization of the Winnipeg Library got really intense. So just this the kind of sight of libraries is a really became this really interesting thing to me and i got to hang out with all these kind of academics who were working on it and these community organizers who were working on it so they were writing a report and i was helping edit that report and then i thought one of them actually my friend bronwyn was like why don't you write a song to go with the report and i was like oh that's that's kind of a nice idea so that's where Millennium for All came from really kind of arose out of this kind of research and stuff I was reading. That was really fun. And it was sort of a calling card for our protests that we did at the library. And that was actually the last performance. The last time I played music live was in February, I guess, of 2020, when we had a mm -hmm. big event at the library. And I sang that song with Christine and my friend Scott. And then we had a big sing along, which was really nice. Yeah, it's kind of a nice, nice way to, <laughs> nice way to, to go out if I don't return to it. Yeah, and then um, yeah, so that that was really fun. And then trying to think of what happened next. Uh, fantasy baseball at the end of the world was just kind of a like pushed itself out of my brain a little bit. It it sort of like demanded to get out, and it was mostly written when I was on dog walks. Yeah. So singing, just singing to myself. And I I feel like that it's kind of a nice kind of closing statement, maybe for the John K. Sampson section of my career. It kind sure. of it kind of talks about um moving on to something else in a, in a way. And and so that's kind of the direction that I'm turning towards. Tell me a little bit about the your your fantasy baseball interest. Is that real? Is that like a real thing yeah. that you do? Because my girlfriend is uh -huh. so into fantasy football, and we're always looking oh, at her at her yeah. people, and we're making trades, yeah. and we're benching people, and we're bringing in new players that other people mm -hmm. in her league have dropped. Tell me a little bit about your interest in in that topic. Sure. So I've been in a fantasy baseball <laughs> keeper league for at least a dozen years now. It's an interesting league. Um, there are now people who are bringing their 
league team owners who are bringing their children in yeah like they're we, they're now some teenage children who are co-managing teams i uh start, started doing that and then i brought in jim bryson who mm -hmm. maybe you know we could then did a record with jim and he's one of my good friends and and also a baseball fan so we started a team together and then we were really bad at it we were always last kind of thing <laughs> So then we brought in our uh, Jim's friend, Dave Hodge, who's a hockey commentator in Canada or was, he's retired now, a really interesting guy. And he kind of took over management of our team. So Jim and I are sort of like, we think of ourselves as like sitting in the luxury box, watching our team. I got really obsessed by it for a few <laughs> years there. It was troubling. I was like, I was, I got really into like all the fantasy baseball podcasts and like, yeah like following uh and then it kind of just dissipated for me i was like i my brain couldn't couldn't handle it anymore but yeah. i did find it like a really interesting culture and like a really kind of fascinating thing that we that we spend so much time on like mm -hmm. <laughs> like I was, yeah just thinking about the amount of time i spent on it so yeah, yeah. and I, I feel like it's a pretty handy metaphor for some things maybe yeah mm -hmm. I mean, for me, interestingly, like I recently have been processing this in my own real life, the way that I, you know, use media in inhale media, the ways that I have, you know, in the last couple of years found myself in like Reddit rabbit holes, like on the Buffalo oh, yeah. Bills Reddit page. Oh, and like, I'm sure, I'm sure. I'll be, yeah, I'll be reading these like intense analyses of like our cornerback problems and mm -hmm. like who is injured on our defensive line. And everybody arguing and bickering about if the Bills Super Bowl window has closed. And yeah. it's like, and all of a sudden I'll snap out of it and I'll be like, whoa, <laughs> 90 minutes have gone by and I have now lost time that I will never get back as long as mm -hmm, I live. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, to me, your song was so fascinating because it's like, OK, I've lost all this time. And then while I've lost all this time, this like really nefarious and dark yeah force has bubbled up in society and it's yeah. like oh gosh maybe i should redirect my attention again you know what i mean maybe i do feel like there's there's part of me that wants to say we should be gentle with ourselves in this regard and that you know there there's something really soothing about it as well like yeah like the fact that yeah we can't always be focused on the horrors of the world mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? so there's also that but yeah it is definitely like it can get a little it can get a little troubling for sure. You've got uh, some a, a relatively new release out. Mm. You've mm -hmm. got a couple, actually. You've got mm -hmm. Hold Music with Christine mm -hmm. Fellows, and you've got the June 1st EP. And June 1st is really cool because, you know, it's it's that very local aspect, those very yeah. local issues that you write about where it's like you walk out your front door and the things that are in the song are across the street from you. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And that's what, to me, what what that June 1st EP seems to be. Tell me a little bit about your work with, with Christine Vivat Vertute and Hold Music and what you two have got going on. Sure. So I guess we started with Hold Music and I, I enjoyed kind of, yeah, we decided we'd do it under the Vivat Vertute banner that we'd been we started this store where we were selling crafts and I got really into weaving a few years back. So we were, we, we've got this store where we sell Christine's music and weaving my weavings and, and her collages and stuff. So we were like, well, yeah, let's do a, do something. And we had all this kind of music stored up Christine and to a lesser degree, myself have done the music for this podcast called heavyweight mm -hmm. um, for the last eight years I guess sweet yeah it's with uh Jonathan Goldstein who's who's a friend of ours and and he's always kind of generously asked us to to make the music every year or make some music every year so we usually spend August most August Christine I have to say does most of the work building like a catalog of of music for them to use in their season and they use a little bit of it they don't use all of it right so we we're like, oh, let's do like a release of our favorite little bits and bits and bites from from that kind of eight years of generating music together for the podcast. And then um, and I had one song um, that I was kind of commissioned to make uh, by by a friend here in Winnipeg called uh, 
do not worry. And, and so we tacked that one on at the end and put it out and that was really fun. And then just put it on Bandcamp, no, no other media. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, June 1st, I just, I had, I had a couple songs. I've been working on that. All my ex-boyfriends are you song for like three or four years. It was, I couldn't make it work. And it was one of those ones that was, I was just poking at forever. And I finally finished that. And then, yeah. So then I wrote two songs for kind of local activist groups. So, so I've been working with this uh, group of, of activists from different faith communities in Winnipeg. So it was like pretty much every faith community you can think of mm -hmm. um, members of their congregations came together uh, to kind of respond to the call of the Wet'suwet'en pipeline protest out in BC. They asked, uh, they asked people to pressure uh, the Royal Bank of Canada, especially as the kind of number one funder of fossil fuels in the world now and a Canadian bank. So we were trying, we kind of got together from all these different faith communities to try and respond to that call and do some activism in the banks, in branches, and also like outside of branches and try and pressure RBC. So I wrote this song, um, I think I just called it RBC or something, but it's to the tune of Abide With Me, which is an old Christian hymn. I wrote that for them and we rehearsed it and then we um, performed it in front of the bank. And then one bank we shut down for a day and then another time we had just a big kind of like gathering and speakers and a concert outside. And so we kind of got this ad hoc community singing group together. And uh, I really loved that. So then after that, we decided I decided I'd do like a community songwriting project. So I got together 12 interested people from that group. And we spent a couple Saturdays like writing a song just yeah. specifically for our protests. And um, that was awesome. I really enjoyed that. Like it was so we we took an old hymn tune. I can't remember which one now. And uh, we just started brainstorming lyrics and then I would take them away and and try and shape them into a song and then bring them back and then they would edit them and then we'd rehearse it. And it was really awesome. It was really fun. I really enjoyed that. So uh, that's where that came from. And then I was at the same time around that time, I was doing a lot of work at uh, or a lot of organizing work with the library folks on the Winnipeg city budget and just years of doing that really kind of gives you an insight into just how awful it is yeah <laughs> and how um how uh anti-human and and how the priorities of this city and i think a lot of cities are so backwards um, buffalo new york right yeah I'm when, sure it's the, thing, right? the lyric roads and police and police and roads is right. is this city too and so right. It, right. it totally connected with me as well i mean i'm glad yeah yeah so yeah um, that was fun that was really fun to write and i wrote that just for kind of like as an inside kind of thing just for the people that i kept ending up at city hall with waiting to do a yeah. budget donation, you know and uh yeah i love those people like they're they're so amazing they take all this time out of their days to just show up and and try and make things better at city hall and uh so yeah i was that was kind of a love song to them so i put all that together i was like those long story but those three songs and then i was like it was june 1st of uh, this year was the 10th anniversary of my quitting drinking yeah so I was like, oh, maybe i'll put something out to like mark that kind of little feet feet um cool. so yeah so that's why i called it june 1st and i made a little weaving to go along with it for the cover and it was just really fun like i just i really enjoyed it i like doing it outside of the kind of industry of music i like not being on the streamers mm -hmm. i liked a lot about it yeah and so it was fun it was kind of i think that's kind of the model well we'll see i never know if i'm ever going to write a song again but but that's kind of the model that i've been enjoying you should write this you should write the song whenever it whenever it hits you you know what i mean okay. yeah i, I feel it. like that's kind of my thing now yeah yeah, yeah. um 
Cool. Well, John, amazing. I'm so glad that you're, you know, creating in in, in whenever it, it hits you and especially the local aspect as well. Do you just record everything at home? Are you recording like yeah? Your house? Um Christine, so I'm terrible at recording. Christine's really good at it. Um uh-huh. and she so she I work in the basement where my because I have a giant loom, giant floor loom that only really fits in the basement. So my studio is in the basement. Christine's on the the half floor upstairs and she has a whole studio set up up there and uses pro tools and i think we have two nice mics maybe it's just one nice mic maybe it's two but anyway she uh she tracks my new rule also is that if i can't record all of it in 90 minutes i'm not going to do it Mm. so that's kind of my thing too because i just I realized that when I was writing songs, I would I was dreading forward, as Christine would call it. I was dreading forward to the recording process. I just got this real like thing in my head where I was like, oh, I hate that part. Mm. Um, so I was like, 90 minutes, just focus on it for 90 minutes. And so that's why they sound a little bit rough and maybe like the guitars aren't always in time. And, you know, it's a little bit, a little bit loosey. Loosey it's loosey. very but it's very authentic and organic, you know, mm. and it, I, I love listening to it um, in the house. Like I have the Bandcamp app and I put it on my little uh, my little speaker, with my Bluetooth over there. And oh, nice. it's just lovely. It sounds great coming through, too. And it sounds like a real song like you can feel as if if I close my eyes, like it almost feels like you're sitting on the other side of the living room doing mm. a living room show. You know what I mean? Nice. That's what oh, it feels like that. to me. That's what I'm hoping for. That's great. Thank you. Well, good. Well, John, <laughs> let's let's chat about some other some other mm-hmm. uh, some other music. Yeah. We're going to take you back in time a little bit. Um, okay. The 30th anniversary of Propagandi's How to Clean Everything passed this year. Right. And I'm wondering if you thought about it, uh, if that if that like anniversary meant anything to you, kind of like Ooh. what that record is for you at this stage in your life. Sure. I didn't really think about it, to be honest. Yeah, I um, I noted it, and and that's I noted how long ago that was. That's thirty years. That seems outrageous. Mm-hmm. Either that, or it seems like way longer ago. It's one of those weird, weird uh, understandings of time where you're like, was that last week or was that last century? And it was last century. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, no, I didn't. I didn't think about it that much. I think I have like a good um, something that I think has been good for me as a musician is that I'll like listen to things obsessively as they're being made. And then after like maybe three or four weeks after they're out, I'll never listen to them again. So the only I remember some things from the record for sure, Mm -hmm. Um, but it's not something that I've heard in, you know, probably 25 years or so. So. So yeah, that's kind of a kind of my my thought about it. But I I do have some definitely some fond memories of that that time. Yeah. Does um does Fat Records send you vinyl repressings whenever they re-release these records? Like, did you get some of the the 2013 20th anniversary reissue with like the expanded uh, track listing and everything like that? Did that stuff come in the mail to you? Yeah, yeah, it did. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I give it to friends who are interested. Um, yeah, they sent a big box of kind of like ones that I gave a whole bunch of them. So I gave those to Chris. They do. They do send them. I have to admit, I don't I don't open them. And and that's not any offense to the band. I, I do the same with my own records. And yeah, and records. I just like Christine. I, I remember Christine told me the story about how she was like. She was tree planting in the 90s at some point. She did that for a few years. And one time the camp, the person organizing the food in the camp made a mistake with the order. And all they had was bananas and salmon for like three weeks. And she was like, (laughs) so they ate that like three times a day. And she can't look at either of those things anymore. And that's kind of a little bit how I feel about like making a record where you're just like, I feel like an actual allergy to records that i've made in the past i'm just like i'm never yeah if i if i hear a yeah weaker than song or any song that i was on i'm just like oh 
Yeah. Well, <laughs> I have two questions about particular okay. songs on this record. Sure. I want to know. So I, I interviewed Conrad Sitchler oh, um, nice. for Conrad. the leg hold trap episode that we did. And oh, he was okay. so generous with his time. We talked to him for hours. And then I've actually hung out with Conrad in person a couple times oh, since I met him through the podcast. And the original song was written for leg hold trap by your band with Conrad toothpick Hercules and Steve. Oh. And you know, I'm I'm wondering about your your thoughts on the like leg hold trap and um cuz I had a blast talking to Conrad about about those those years. Um and I wonder if you have any like thoughts on the leg hold trap by um Toothpick Hercules how it became a propaganda song. Like any memories to stand out about that particular tune? Sure. I didn't recall that it was that both bands played it. That's kind of shows a lack of judgment in both bands, in my opinion. <laughs> um yeah. I mean that's it's not a good song. It's uh I can hear myself kind of trying to write like a bad religion song or something. It sounds like someone trying to write a song, as I recall it, the lyrics, like, I don't know, it's like, uh, I see it sometimes in writers where you're just like, they want to write something. So it's like this, this kind of word paste that they spread on, spread on a structure of a song. Um, I guess like one thing I would say that is like, maybe it's a nice way of showing like, I probably wrote that song when I was like 16 or 17. Mm -hmm. And so it's, maybe it's a nice like signpost for how I learned maybe to write songs a little better while I was in propaganda. Cool. Um, so yeah, I would, maybe that would be the only thing I would think about it, but. Um, nice. Okay. So the next one is right. related to showdown. And uh, so the slips and tangles version that you put out acoustic, just as a standalone song yeah. is something I didn't ever discover until I started doing this podcast. But on an early episode of this podcast, I was pretty hard on showdown and I got a lot of like <laughs> listener grief about my, oh, my, my showdown opinions uh -huh. because like the greenest eyes version acoustic is lovely, but then it feels like it was like this like mashed up thing. So I'm a big advocate that they should have always been like left as separate songs. And so I'm wondering if you can weigh in on the debate of me versus the listeners of my own podcast who have gone to Ooh. war over showdown over the last three and a half years. <laughs> I'm going to take a third, a third position <laughs> and say that that's not a good song either. I'm sorry. Like it's, it's, it's not good. Again, it's, it's kind of like my section of it at least is that kind of word paste of like trying to write. I, w I wish I could describe this better, but like, you have it's when you're trying to write a song and so you make words go together that sound like they mean something but they actually don't right mm. so i think that that a lot this is how we learn how to write things right but yeah again that song written when i was 16 years old is not a good song i would like if that was brought to me in a songwriting workshop i would say you should start over oh my so, gosh <laughs> I love that. And like wh whenever I interviewed Jacob Burdovsky for the podcast oh, yeah. a couple of years ago, he was talking about those songwriting workshops that you did and he just loved it. Oh. He's he was he loved showing you things and we had a really great conversation about those workshops. So that's really cool that you bring yeah, those up. Yeah. yeah, I love doing those. And again, like the community aspect of that is really, really fun. And I do feel like that I uh, I could have benefited. Uh, like one of the reasons I love doing them is that I could have benefited from them so much. Like I could have been prevented from from having songs like Greenest Eyes or Showdown come out. Um, I think when, as I recall, the like split thing, it was just fun, right? Like, it, again, like, I feel like the context is important. It was propaganda at the time was really making music for a few hundred people, right? In Winnipeg. Mm -hmm. It was about showing something fun at, at a show right like Love it was it. like yeah so it was like to me i was always like oh that's kind of fun it was just fun yeah yeah so but i uh yeah i'm i'm not uh i don't i don't find much redeemable in the in in the lyrics 
personally myself i don't remember chris's but um minor yeah that's again it's like a word paste the the context <laughs> thing is really interesting too because like you know um my, my friend who's become a friend aaron karns he wrote a book called ska sucks in defense of ska <laughs> and or not not ska sucks but in defense of ska is the title of the book and he wrote a section yeah. about ska sucks where he talks about the contextualized nature of that song oh, yeah. within yeah. the so winnipeg specific. so yeah. specific and it was misconstrued um in so many ways um right, about the right. meaning of it and like where it was coming from so it's really awesome that you bring up the context of like we were playing for like this tiny group of people in this one city in this very isolated part of the continent and this is what it became so yeah it's, it's i feel so like important. yeah that was that was always my first like when i first listened to propagandi's tape fuck the scene that i bought at the skateboard shop for you know like four dollars or whatever I was like, that's what I, I loved about it. Well, aside from the fact that there were real songs and real, like, great, played beautifully and recorded in a really unusual and direct way, that uh, that it was really kind of focused on that scene, really. Like, so mm -hmm. it was like broadsides against it, but also encouragements of community and and a real just like, real fun. Like, it was fun. Yeah. Nice. Well, let's chat a little bit about Let's Talk More Rock. Um, mm. The 25th anniversary of that one just passed. And something that's really cool about this is I went to Winnipeg in 2021 for oh. those three propaganda shows at Park Theater that they did over the Thanksgiving weekend. Nice. And when I was there, um, obviously, Chris and, and Todd and Jordan Sulin knew about the podcast. And Chris gave me a copy of the 25th anniversary reissue. Um, as, as a gift, which was mm. so, so nice of him to do. Um, mm. And, um, you know, I'm curious about what this release means to you, because to me, this is like it's been stated on this podcast many times as being the most important propaganda record because of how the ideas were so specific and it was laid out on the cover and how it was kind of visionary and ahead of its time um, with regards to many issues that we're still dealing with in society today. And so I'm just curious what your what your thoughts are on this one as as a whole piece uh looking back um two and a half decades later wow yeah yeah i have a lot of uh good memories about those some of those songs especially i loved playing um nation states was really fun to play mm -hmm. um preteen mccarthyist was really fun yeah, I don't know that I really have a lot to say about it, but it was um, it was an interesting record to make. We we went to San Francisco. I certainly learned a lot um, <clears throat> about the process of making a record. Um, the first record was recorded really fast, and the Less Talk More Rock w was a more kind of labored process. Mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, I think I really learned a lot from that that whole process definitely nice yeah a, a song that really stands out to me on that record with regards to to your songwriting is is gifts because mm. gifts never goes on to become a weaker than song um mm -hmm. like anchorless did letter of resignation went on to become a weaker than song so those other songs got kind of like the the um the new updated treatment but gifts yeah. never does but I have a theory that you actually really like gifts because you you continue <laughs> to play it acoustic and mm -hmm. your acoustic version there's a video of you playing it online where it's like this is a propaganda song and then you go into it acoustic and mm -hmm. or maybe with your electric guitar but clean on a clean guitar right. and it's just so lovely mm -hmm. and to me I was like this is what gifts is supposed to be so tell me a little bit about your your thoughts on gifts because your your updated sure. version that you've done live is my favorite version that mm -hmm. I've heard. Mm -hmm. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I feel like that song was a bit of a turning point for me. Um, that it's a little bit better than the other songs that I'd written up until that point. Um, I think it has some nice moments, and I still, yeah, I still have the impulse to like every once in a while think about it. So that's a good sign, I guess, for a song. <laughs> uh, I wrote it, I think, when I was working. Uh, I was working the 7-Eleven night shift, I think, at the time. A pretty dreary time. I think it kind of captures that feeling of like waking up in the middle of the day and just like 
um, wondering what you're doing with your life. Mm-hmm. Um, my brain goes to it sometimes. So I think that that's a good sign of, of the song. Yeah. Have you ever put it to tape um, beyond no, performing I haven't, it live? No, I feel like it'll just exist in the air. That's kind of kind of best. Like that's, I should have done that. I think one of my regrets is that I re-recorded Anchorless and to a certain degree Letter of Resignation. Mm, interesting. Um, for weaker than songs. I felt like that was just a sign that I was insecure about the, the rest of the songs um, and that I felt I needed the padding and the like support of those songs that I'd already established with other people. Mm-hmm. Um, it would have been better if, if, if I hadn't bothered like anchorless again, not a good song, but it's like um, I think the second verse that I added for the weaker lands makes it a little bit better, but also the urgency is kind of lost and I don't know. Yeah. Um, so I feel like, with gifts, I resisted the urge to make it to double up on it a little bit, mm-hmm. and I'm I'm glad I did because yeah, I think it yeah it exists. It's not it's not a bad song. Um, it's not great, but it's you know it'll do. <laughs> you know, it's my favorite. It's my favorite of your songs in that yeah. in that early era. Um, yeah. So I'm a big I'm I a think big me gifts too. Proponent. I think I think I would say that too. Nice. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, on the anchorless episode that I did for the podcast, I actually had Lauren Denizio from Warriors mm. on, and Lauren yeah. was just like so overjoyed to tell stories about touring with you and touring with the Weaker Thans, and so and um, and it was just a, a lovely time to hang out. Yeah, they're great. Um, they're they're a beautiful songwriter, and I'm really glad that we kind of found each other, kind of kindred. We're kind of kindred writers i feel like in a lot of ways yeah oh that's lovely maybe i'll i'll listen to that i do love their their uh their new records wonderful so yeah getting to meet people like that has been a real joy for me too is like meeting younger songwriters and learning from them and and uh getting to watch them play and yeah it's been it's been good yeah that was winter wheat they came out with oh right it was it was a solo tour for you right with winter wheat But it was with Greg and Jason and Christine. So yeah, it was a full band and yeah. Awesome. John, what do you most positively associate um with your like memories of like working with propaganda? I I just learned a lot, right? Like um I learned how to drive a van and I learned how to sleep in a van. I learned how to write songs a little better. I learned um just the kind of uh, structure of Chris's songs really uh, imprinted on me the the way um, the economy of language, the idea that you have a certain amount of space to say something and you should use it all and kind of leave it all out there. And yeah, that kind of idea that the choruses are not that important. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, what else? I mean, yeah, I have nothing. Um, I have nothing bad to say. I mean, I uh, I also can't underestimate the material support they gave me. Um, so after I left Propaganda, I received royalties from those first two records. And at that time, that was a serious amount of money. So it paid for... Um, I didn't have to get a job. I was able to do a whole bunch of things I wanted to do. And mm-hmm. then I was able to start the Weaker Thans and you know, I was able to pay for a practice space to buy our first van, to take a loss on the first tours. And they paid for the recording and pressing of our first two records, right? So I don't know where I would be without them, really. So yeah, I mean, those are all like really important things to me. So I have a question. Can I ask if being in the band in the mid nineties and playing Mm. live was scary because I've like heard Mm. recordings and I'm just like, I would be such a chicken in this situation. And I'm just like, were these guys like just so brave or like, cause it sounds so scary to me. A lot of the, a lot of the experiences. I mean, my memories are pretty dim, but I feel (laughs) like, yeah, there were some scary moments for sure. There were now that I think about it. Yeah. It it was pretty intense at times, fractious and like really like 
confrontational part of that were the audiences too right like it was there was a real kind of confrontational edge to some of the audience yeah and that's certainly not my natural inclination right <laughs> yeah I, want, I would prefer it if everyone liked me um yeah that's my great <laughs> great <laughs> uh, weaknesses uh that I think a lot of people share there was also something about being part of a band that didn't think that way that was um valuable to me and and pushed me to places that um I think I'm glad that I went to but sure yeah it was it was scary amazing I, you know and I was not like I was not cut out for it obviously like as it a wouldn't player, be for me I couldn't do yeah, it yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> But like as a also as a player, like Chris and Jordan are are exceptional musicians, and um, it's not. And I'm not like I'm I'm just not musically that. I mean, I'm sounding like I'm I'm talking down on myself, but it's just a fact. Like I'm not. Uh, it's it's not the kind of technical prowess I just I don't I don't have right. So it's kind of a. I didn't fit in in a whole bunch of ways, right? Yeah, like in a multitude of ways. And that's that's interesting too. Like that's like, I feel like maybe that happens less often now is like at the time it was like, I was the only bass player who tried out, right? Mm -hmm. like I, was, I was their only option really. <laughs> and uh, the tryout was just like, okay, yeah, you learned those songs. So let's play some shows. I don't think that that would happen now. I think mm -hmm. like, like that weird combination of personalities maybe wouldn't be a thing anymore. So I thought it was, it was good for a little while. It was interesting. Nice. Yeah. 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 That rocks. John, where would you like, where can people, you know, find your work if, uh, hmm. if they want to like get in touch and like see what you're doing, because you've sure. got so much cool stuff going on creatively, um, Tell people where to kind of direct their attention if they're if they're curious. Sure. So um, there's the Vivat Vertute Bandcamp, mm -hmm. and there's um, vivatvertute.com. Um, you might need to put a big cartel in there somewhere. Okay. But anyway, yeah. Um, so that's vivatvertute.com or vivatvertute.bigcartel.com has uh, weavings that I've made and um, Christine's music and links to some other stuff. So that's kind of, it's been fun to have a little, we call it the family store and it's just a, uh, it's a nice little, um, nice little project. Yeah. I, uh, I bought roses on the vine uh, off your oh, store. Yeah, um, yeah, that's right. That's right. During the pandemic, I was like nice. just getting records left and right. Um, What do you like about, uh, you know, stuff we all get and roses on the vine because christine's mm. work is so cool and i've never yeah. heard anything like it besides her um right. it's so original it's such an original voice um and mm. i just love it what do you think about what do you think about those records i love those records yeah they're they're my favorites um i really like i get to hear them emerge from the upstairs i'm in the basement but i can hear it uh, and um, especially um, stuff we all get really emerged throughout the pandemic. So it was like I heard every minute of the of the growth of that record. And yeah, Christine is is my favorite writer and and my primary editor. And and um, I think she's a wonderful writer. So I'm really grateful for those records. And and I think they sound really cool. Um, it's it's always great to hear Jason Tate play. Uh, yes. I think Christine, Christine and Jason have this really super interesting musical relationship. I think they're really like meant for each other <laughs> in nice. a way, you know? um, and uh, and they work really well together. Yeah, I, I love I love those records for sure. Jason's got he's doing stuff too, you know. I I love mm. his work on uh, on on Jacob's record as well, and yeah. Jason seems like he's out there really working hard and uh, and playing a lot too. Yeah, he's and he's been working on a solo record. I'm not allowed. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say it, but anyway, he's been working Fine. on his own stuff, and uh, it's uh, it sounds in incredible. It's amazing. Gonna be, you're gonna love it. Um. So yeah, he's yeah he's he's always um, he's always making great great things in his garage well 
John Sampson Fellows, what an absolute pleasure and a thrill to chat with you. I love hanging out and and having fun and hearing stories. And it just means so much to me that, that we got to have this opportunity to uh, to chat for a bit. Thank you so much for for joining me for um, Unscripted Moments, a podcast about propaganda. I really enjoyed that. Thank you, Greg. <laughs>